come from KLA Tencore, so let me take a brief moment to describe KLA Tencore so you have the context of this presentation. Uh, KLA, you probably haven't heard of KLA Tencore unless you're in the semiconductor industry or possibly the solar or disk drive industries. Uh, we are the largest manufacturer of uh, process control equipment for the semiconductor industry. Uh, and to give a sense of probably the average selling price of uh, one of the pieces of equipment is probably in the range of $8 million. We have things that are cheap in the $1 to $2 million range and things that go to, to about $30 million. Sort of like a fighter jet uh, ends up being in the $30 million range to give you a sense. And so it's very complex uh, equipment using very sophisticated technologies. Uh, very advanced phys physics. Effectively, what we're doing uh, f in the semiconductor market is we're the eyes for our customers. They're dealing with uh, uh, lines and items, features on their products that are very small, smaller than you can see, about one one thousandth the thickness of a human hair. And so you can't see that with the human eyeball. And so we have very advanced optics using very advanced light sources and or electron beams uh, to be able to uh, image and measure and look for defects and make measurements associated with uh, the device characteristics on a semiconductor. So that, that's what we do. Uh, it's uh, driven by something that's called Moore's Law, which is the advancing technology of the semiconductor industry where you're effectively getting more and more uh, transistors on a, on a wafer, on a device uh, every two years or so. And so what I'm going to talk about is uh, uh, somewhat how the industry is evolving and specifically uh, in partnerships not only with the semiconductor companies and their supply base, but then uh, a company like KLA Tencore and many of our peers and their supply bases. And so it's, it's about uh, partnerships. So a traditional sourcing model would be you know, you establish a set of specs and requirements, you go out and you look for a variety of possible suppliers and partners, uh, you go ahead and you bid those out, uh, ultimately deciding uh, who will produce the various items that you need, and you incorporate those into your production. However, with very advanced technologies that uh, often isn't the best way. You need a different business model on how you perform your development, especially on the most advanced of your advanced technologies. And a lot of that involves some very special partnering. Now, as you begin to think of that partnering, because you're going to be dealing with uh, potentially one supplier, and they may be the only supplier in the world that has the intellectual property and know-how, uh, to be able to successfully deal with you, but you have to first decide what kind of partnership you want. And there's, of course, a lot of a variety of partnerships uh, done on a variety of different ways. Uh, uh, sometimes it's a matter of choice. HP Canon, for those that don't realize, HP printers, the desktop printers that uh, many of you have bought, that the print engine comes from Canon. And they have done that for years. It's a, an exclusive relationship that has worked for years. Other people make those types of uh, uh, print engines, but HP decided as a matter of choice due to the complexity in going to market to pick a single partner, a sole source for that. Capability, and this is what's more common in the semiconductor industry where you will find a partner that may have very unique capabilities and you'll establish exclusive relationships with these very high-end partners, ultimately to deliver technology solutions that differentiate your products from the competitors. That's why the exclusivity is important, and that's why the capability of that supplier uh, is, is quite important. And that's mainly the type of relationships I'm going to be talking about. There are, of course, other kinds where you may want it for control purposes or just cost purposes as well. Now, of course, if you head towards these very special partnerships, you're going to take on a lot of risk. But what most people forget 
is that you already were taking on a lot of risk. If you're developing advanced technologies and you're trying to develop that with a variety of partners, you're going to incur redundant development expense. You're going to incur potential IP leakage uh, that may occur as you're exposing more information to multiple uh, partners. Uh, at the same time, if you have a sole partner, you have risk of price uh, escalation. If you're teaching them a lot of things, you have risk of creating a competitor. Uh, and therefore, establishing and monitoring that relationship and partnership becomes quite important. Uh, but again, it's about balancing risk, because if you don't partner, if you try to do it on your own and you don't have those very unique capabilities to, again, differentiate. Uh, in Kaylee Tenkor's case, our market share for many of our products ranges in the 60 to 80 percent range, often 100 percent. It's somewhat necessary for us to be able to do that because we're running R&D uh, in a significant way. So it's not about risk elimination, it's about risk balancing. And so I'm just briefly going to speak uh, for just a few more minutes on what some of these risks are. But you first have to determine the, the types of relationships that exist. And there are a variety, and I use a variety of well-knowns here, a marriage, for, for better or worse, richer or poorer, uh, a customer supplier. I'll tell you what I want, what I really, really want. For those of you from Britain, you'll recognize that as the Spice Girls. This will probably be the only slide you'll ever see that has a, a quote from the Dalai Lama and the Spice Girls <laughs> on the same slide. The old Ford, you have a choice, et cetera. Now, as you're working these partnerships, the partnership needs to be negotiated. Understanding both parties' interests, or in the case of three parties or four parties, all the parties' interests, and developing options around those interests. Understanding the standards that make those options, the better options, become important, and then surrounding that is the relationship, communication, the commitment to execute that becomes critical. But you often run into issues as you're developing these. A lot of cognitive biases end up happening. There's something I call the love factor. And so typically when you've just done that new deal, established the partnership, it's exciting, you're thrilled, you're in love. You're in love. And just like many folks uh, and individuals that fall in love, they forget to ask the hard questions. Geez, do we, before we get married, do we both want to have children? How will we raise those children? Sometimes those questions are left for a later time, often found difficult. You can't do that in these types of partnerships. Going to the other end, there's the hate factor. Stakes are high. Uh, in this case, you have a, a sole source, so the customer may feel they have less relative leverage than in their typical negotiations. And because they feel less powerful, they respond to certain actions by the supplier attributing malintent, which often isn't the case. And therefore, you need to have uh, a staff that can deal with those relationships um, uh, and monitor them at multiple levels. The distrust factor. Uh, again, here, one party doing something that causes the others to lose trust. Um, and now you feel wronged. And now you begin to behave. And so you get into this domino effect. Um, and that's why, uh, as that happens at a working level, having various levels of relationship become important to sort through that. And then there are a variety of myths that surround what people feel. Uh, the business partnerships are all about money. They're not. There are many other factors that are at play. That true strategic partnerships aren't about money. Well, that's also not true in a business environment. Both are important. And the third and most common myth is if you are partnering that way, uh, that you can't really look at competitive alternatives. And that's not true. It's not, in fact, you really should be looking at competitive alternatives. It's how, as a partnership, you agree to do that as well. HP continue to look at alternatives regardless. And so when you structure this process, it's continuous. You're constantly looking at that relationship, meeting at various executive levels and the working level, making sure all the roles and responsibilities, basically it's a lot of hard work. Uh, looking for those cognitive biases that occur at the working level and breaking through them. Uh, using both hard and soft metrics as a way to uh, manage through it. And 
to help with those feelings of of a loss of alternative, it doesn't mean you should do that. You should begin to strengthen your alternatives. In fact, both parties are. You want, you want to be a customer that your supplier wants to deal with, and as a supplier, you want to be one that your customer wants to deal with, which means you need to be competitive. And so you need to be looking at the competitive alternatives, but simply in a very close and tight partnership, you do this in an open way, not revealing confidential information that you're finding, but revealing that you will be doing it, how you're doing it, and how the benefit of that will, will ultimately drive a better partnership because competition makes us all better. So in summary, strategic partnerships can make the difference between success and failure. If you partner with the right party and you partner in a successful way, you can bring competitive differentiation that none of your, nobody else in the industry can bring. And when you do that, it enables you to bring value to the customers that none can bring, which ultimately improve your market share and the value you bring to your customers. Thank you.